and welcome to Clear Skies Astro. I'm Gustavo Maestre and today we're going to be covering my top 10 tips for the beginner astrophotographer. Now many people when they join this hobby can find it a bit intimidating because of the lack of information as well as the complexity of the equipment needed to do astrophotography. So I've put together a list of my top 10 tips to help shorten your learning curve and make it as easy for you to avoid some of the pitfalls that many astrophotographers can fall into. That being said, there's going to be some great information in this video, so please do save the video down below for future reference, and as always, please do like and subscribe the video, it really does make a difference, and we greatly appreciate it. Now let's go ahead and get into this list. So number one on the list is to become familiar with your camera. I know that when I received my first DSLR, it was a bit intimidating with all of the different functions, as well as the menus in the camera. So what you're going to want to do is if you haven't used a DSLR or a mirrorless camera before, is just take it out during the day and take some pictures, get familiar with doing the focus, and as well as the aperture, ISO, and shutter speed. You're gonna to wanna to be able to navigate the camera by touch, like reviewing your pictures after you take them, because in many cases, you're gonna be operating the camera in little to no light. Now back to the other pieces of getting familiar with the camera. The cameras allow light to come into the camera in three different ways. You have aperture, ISO, and shutter speed. In terms of aperture or f-stop, the lower the number, the more light that's going to be let in from the lens to the sensor. Generally in astrophotography, you're going to want to have the lens as wide open as possible. So you'll want your aperture as low as you can set it, generally. Then you have your ISO. The ISO is the sensitivity of the sensor to light. Too much sensitivity creates noise, too little sensitivity makes your pictures dark. And then shutter speed is related to how long the shutter will stay open to allow light to come into the camera. So if I were to give you some basic details and settings for a camera, generally you'll want your aperture as low as you can set it. Your ISO, a good starting range would be between 800 and 1600. You may need to go higher or lower depending if you're shooting in dark skies or in urban light. So please be mindful of that. And then your shutter speed is related to your focal length. So a formula that you can use is taking your focal length of your lens divided into 500. And this is a rule, it's generally a pretty good one to use if you have no other reference. So if you have a 50 millimeter lens divided into the 500, that means that you can have your shutter speed set as high as nine to 10 seconds before you get star trails. So you can use those numbers as a basic frame of reference for your pictures. Now, number two on the list, is actually to set up your whole rig in the house during the day. When you go out there at nighttime, you're gonna generally feel a little bit of pressure. The sky is getting dark, your deep sky object is right there, you're dying to shoot it, as well as there could be clouds rolling in, so you will generally feel some pressure, especially in the beginning. I'd highly recommend setting up your rig fully in your house and taking note of the sequence of events that need to happen for you to go ahead and put it up as well as building comfort on attaching all of the accessories and getting the rig fully set up to go. Setting up in the house is a useful way to build some practice at least a few times so that when you do take your rig outside, you're ready to go and shoot your deep sky object. It will pay dividends in the end for you. Number three on the list is more for mental peace of mind. So when you get out there your very first time, possibly even your second time, don't expect to get any shots. The very first time I tried to set up an astrophotography rig, I spent two hours trying to do polar alignment and did not get a single picture. And it took me three tries to actually get some pictures. And then every time that I've upgraded my rig to like a dedicated astro cam, there's always been that learning curve where I can go sometimes a whole night without really getting a great shot. So it's just for your mental well-being to know that if you get out there, you may not get a shot and it's just being mentally prepared that that could happen. And if so, it's okay and you just walk away with it being a learning experience for you. Number four on the list is understanding your weather conditions. So there's a few different apps you can use. Maybe you have a regular weather app. Uh, there's one called Astrophoric, which I do use, and another one called Clear Skies, which I use as well. I tend to check my weather across three different apps. Now, don't forget to just trust your eyes because sometimes the apps will tell you that there's gonna be cloud cover, or high clouds or low visibility, but you go outside and it's actually okay. So you're gonna want a few different apps to do comparisons of the weather 
on top of just doing your own visual observation. Now with the Astrophoric app, you can compare the weather with the sunset and sunrise times. You can see if there's high, medium, or low level clouds. You can check visibility, you can check seeing, and as well, like I mentioned, cloud cover. It's a great app to use to confirm your weather. Now number five on your list, verify that your deep sky object matches your equipment. So when I first got into astrophotography, I had a 200 millimeter Canon lens, and I thought that that meant I could shoot the entire sky, but that's not necessarily the case. So different focal lengths will be good at different things. If you have like a 200 millimeter lens, it's gonna be good for very large deep sky objects like the North America Nebula, the Andromeda Galaxy, for instance. If you have something in the length of 700 millimeters, for instance, you're gonna have different objects to shoot. And even some telescopes are over 2000 millimeters in focal length, that'll be good for different kinds of objects. So you're just gonna to wanna to know which deep sky objects will match your focal length. There's a few things that you'll wanna do. So you're gonna to wanna to go ahead and use apps like Stellarium or Sky Portal and look at what the visual magnitude is. Generally, the lower the number, the better and easier it will be for you to image. If you're shooting with something around 200 millimeters, then you're not gonna go maybe higher than an eight for the visual magnitude. If you have something larger, you can go maybe to 10 or so with 700 millimeters and so forth. But basically you wanna have an object that has a low visual magnitude because that means that it's brighter and easier to image. Next, you're gonna also wanna look at the moon phase and the location of the moon. So if it's a full moon, probably not the greatest night to shoot, but you could shoot opposite of the moon uh, and get some decent results. The other thing is that you want to see what time does the moon set or rise to your location. So if you know that the moon is setting at a certain time, you can either set up and start at that time, or if you know the moon is rising, then maybe shooting in the opposite direction uh, to compensate for that. First getting into astrophotography, you're going to want items that are, I would say, a five or six or below, and then that way they're easier to image. Next, you're gonna to wanna to know the apparent size of your deep sky object. It's measured in arc minutes and, and usually it has one to two dimensions. It could be 30 by 50, for instance. And then that gives you an idea for one, how it's gonna frame up in your camera, but also it'll give you an idea of the size because the smaller it is in terms of arc minutes, the more difficult it'll be to image. So number six on the list is to take your test shots and review them carefully. I can't stress how important this one is. When you take your test shots, make sure you zoom in closely to review if there's any kind of star trails, if you have focusing errors, possibly if you're not framed up properly, or maybe you just missed your deep sky object altogether. You're definitely gonna wanna zoom in carefully and then also reviewing the histogram in your camera to see that you're imaged properly. You can also find that through your test shots, you can look for overexposure and underexposure which can easily happen if you're not reviewing your pictures. So I can't stress this one enough. Take your test shots. Now, number seven on the list is to go ahead and after you set up your equipment and you start your imaging session, to go and check on it every 30 minutes for at least the first hour. Now, the reason I mention this is because in my own imaging, I've had issues where the intervalometer batteries went dead and things of that nature. And you really don't wanna miss your imaging especially if you've been waiting on the weather or the right moon phase or your deep sky object to be visible from where you are. So you're gonna to wanna to definitely check your imaging session as it goes to make sure that everything is working properly. Now your session itself will vary in length depending on your conditions, what you're trying to shoot, and maybe limitations that you have on your time even. Now at a minimum, you're gonna to wanna to shoot for at least 15 minutes. Now, that is very low in the world of astrophotography, but that will give you somewhat of a picture with some decent detail uh, to review. Most astrophotographers will not wanna shoot with less than one hour on their deep sky object. And then most of us will shoot over three hours on an object. So just keep in mind that you want at least 15 minutes on your deep sky object with a minimum target of one hour as you're starting off. Now, number eight on the list is taking down your notes on how to take calibration frames. Now, calibration frames are used to reduce noise and improve your picture quality. They come in four different kinds, generally speaking. You have lights, darks, bias, and flats. 
Now, lights are basically just your regular pictures. So that's the easiest one to get. So you just take your picture, those are your lights. Your darks, what you do is you take your lens cap and put it over the lens with all the settings the same and you snap your pictures. Bias, you don't touch any settings except for the shutter speed and set the shutter speed as fast as it can go. And then flats, you're gonna want some kind of a tablet, cell phone, or a light panel, put it over the lens, and then change the shutter speed until the image is properly exposed. Now, the more of these kind of calibration frames you take, generally speaking, the better the quality of your picture will be. But you could get away with taking 50 of each calibration frame for reference. But your calibration frames are gonna be definitely important, and you'll wanna go ahead and do them every time that you shoot. Now, number nine on the list is when you're uploading and moving files, don't delete anything until you've produced your final picture. It's so easy to make a mistake and delete a file and possibly toss out your entire imaging session. So I highly stress, don't delete anything until you get to the very end. Trust me on this one. Now, number 10 on the list is to create a setup ritual. I'm gonna be creating a video that deep dives whether you're using an astro cam or a DSLR, but regardless of your setup, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you create a list of what needs to be done every time you set up so that it makes imaging easier whether you're on the go or you're at home. You'll wanna list out all of the steps required to get you started shooting. And then as I mentioned before, you'll also wanna have that list combined with your information on how to do calibration frames. But regardless of your setup, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you create a list of what needs to be done every time you set up making sure that your connections are set up, that whatever kind of imaging software or intervalometer you're using is set up, that you're focusing and using a Botanov mask, framing and making sure that your deep sky object is properly in the field of view. I hope you find these tips helpful as you begin your astrophotography journey. It can be a challenging one in the beginning, but I will tell you that with some dedication and repetition, you'll definitely be able to overcome it and get some incredible pictures of the sky. And once you get those pictures, you're going to be hooked. Trust me. Now, again, if you find this video helpful, please do like and subscribe down below. I really appreciate your time, and I wish you clear skies. Get those cameras up.